Mr. Marcus Komnenos, Sophia Gapa, Rupert Podson, thank you very much for your availability and for agreeing to discuss this very important topic within the Digital Markets Research Hub. As we know, last week on the 6th of April, uh, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate, Climate Action has published the 11th Amendment uh, to the German Competition Act, and it joined the club of different member states who are also in, engaging in this uh, competence discussion about how the DMA and other competition law competition laws and solato instruments will be enforced in the future. It's a very vibrant topic, very important and very promising, uh, full of juristic, economic and policy making uh, intricacies. And I'm very pleased that we have this opportunity to, to, to have a, the preliminary conversation on, the, on this with people who are deeply engaged in the in this in this theme who understand the mechanics but who are also very approachable and eloquent in, the, in uh, as speakers so without further ado i propose with just as a matter of background ruprecht can you just provide us this, uh, a reminder rather um, what is at stake why the division of competence or division of labor between national competition authorities and uh, the commission uh, is so important issue yeah, that's a good question. And thank you, Olesh, for having us. Uh, so briefly, after the introduction of this uh, proposal, and we have to say it is a proposal, so it will still go to Parliament and um, maybe changed here and there. But um, I think that the problem that we are addressing here primarily is something that will not cause a steer in, uh, in the German Parliament unless we now identify so incredible legal obstacles with Marcus' help that we have to change everything, but we'll see. Um, so the problem that we are discussing or the issue that we would first want to tackle, and I think, is that um, we have the Digital Markets Act being introduced now with the sole enforcer, the European Commission. That's sort of the whole idea of the, of the DMA, that the Commission is in the driving seat and takes the uh, decision for the DMA. But then during the negotiations to the Digital Markets Act, we saw some sort of uh, opposition or for some some uh, wishes from member states and I think Sophie Gappa who works in the ministry is much better than I am uh, to uh, to discuss this in more detail but we saw that some member states wanted to have their authorities have their say in enforcement of the Digital Markets Act. And this comes now to a climax, if I may say, with the current proposal of the, of the German government, where the Bundeskartellamt, uh, the German Federal Competition Agency, is empowered to, um, well, to support the European Commission, uh, to put it mildly, and uh, we will discuss that in more detail, I think, and where it also takes some measures to empower private uh, people, so pr private claimants, to go to court and um, enforce the DMA in courts. So the 11th Amendment of the, of the German Competition Act actually in this part, it has other aspects which are quite interesting as well, and which we will touch upon, I think. Um, but but one of the issues is that DMA enforcement will be easier in Germany for private parties and private enforcement, and the Bundeskartellamt will have a stronger role in enforcement of the Digital Markets Act. And that is, of course, um, quite interesting. And it also builds, if, if I may add that sentence sort of just for background, it also builds on a longstanding history, if you may say so, of Germany enforcing um, competition rules with big tech firms. I mean, all all people following you closely, Olesh, will know that uh, Germany did the Facebook case, um, uh, that there are other decisions like the price parity clauses case in booking.com, where Germany took a very distinctive stance in um, big tech competition related fields on the basis of national competition laws. And now we have sort of a mix of competition laws, national and European competition laws that will be applied to big tech, plus the DMA being applied by the European Commission with the help of the Bundeskartellamt and other national enforcers, um, uh, possibly, and of course, the national and European competition rules will remain in place and there will be uh, sort of a certain 
well, melange, if I may call it, of enforcers of institutions of laws that are applicable to this field. Something that is, I, I think we are not discussing that in detail, but of course, if you think from a perspective, from a larger perspective, not only taking competition issues in, into perspective, you will see that there are an enormous or a lot of other rules in the field like the Data Act, the DSA, the P2B regulation, etc. all kinds of rules that are now coming for the companies active in the digital field. Um, and that needs some form of coordination, probably. A good friend of my a colleague from Newcastle mentioned, among other initiatives, Fish and Ships Act. Uh, uh, it, Sophie, if I can revert to you um, in this regard, we understand that the, the, the rationale of the DMA appears to be quite, well, at least for, for, for many of its supporters, quite elegant, and we have centralized enforcement, we have some kind of revision where we focus the competence, quite discretionary and uh, heavyweight powers in the hands of single enforcer, and it somehow goes in line with this narrative of, of uh, defragmentation, uh, etc. What motivates national competition authorities and national governments, more generally, of, uh, of member states, some member states, uh, to somehow re reconsider proactively this proposed formula and to kind of to, to make it a little bit more nuanced? Yeah, thank you for having me and this, this very interesting and good question. I think. Um, first of all, I would like to, to really differentiate between our position during the negotiations, because during the negotiations, when we were discussing together with the Commission and the European Parliament, the draft proposal of the Commission, it is true that the German government, together with uh, our French and Dutch colleagues in particular, were really pushing for decentralized enforcement. And um, because we just had the impression that um, the Commission, while it's doing a great job, has really limited, in particular, personal capacities. Um, and I think in the impact assessment, it was said that um, the Commission will have 80 people of staff um, monitoring and enforcement the DMA. At the same time, we're looking at quite a few potential gatekeepers and a long list of prohibitions and obligations. And we just feel that even though the DMA is an ex ante regulation and uh, self-executing, it will be a very difficult task to really monitor uh, these obligations and make sure that uh, gatekeepers obey them. So uh, we really pushed and said, okay, let's take this task together. Why don't we add the um, experience, the personal capacities um, of national competition, uh, national competition authorities and make this work together? And I have to say, unfortunately, um, we did not succeed. And I think the DMA now is really straightforward saying that the uh, European Commission is the sole enforcer. And as the DMA is agreed, we totally accept that. Um, on the other hand, now that the DMA entered into force, we want to make use of the leeway that the DMA foresees and um, gave us to make sure that the DMA will be effectively implemented. And um, Indeed, there is one um, article, it's Article 38, that explicitly says that national competition authorities can support um, the European competition um, if the um, national legislators grant their national competition authorities the competence and the investigative power to investigate possible cases of non-compliance. And um, looking on what we propose with our uh, 11th uh, amendment of our national law, that's exactly what we do. We even try to mirror the, the exact wording of the DMA to make sure that we don't overstep the legal boundaries that are set by the DMA, but we just want to make use of the room that we have. And so that's the main DMA pillar of our um, recast. And then as Ruprecht already said, there is a second part where we try to facilitate private enforcement, also against the background that we believe that an efficient enforcement of the DMA will be key to make sure that it really can um, deliver. <laughs> um, and therefore we basically try to expand all the legal um, instruments that we have in our national legislation vis-a-vis -vis traditional competition law uh, cases and expand them to DMA private enforcement. So to make sure that um, 
the DMA is not uh, as effectively um, enforced privately as uh, traditional uh, cases. And at the same time, we make sure that the courts are responsible for these cases that are also responsible for competition law cases because we feel that they have the expertise and experience um, so that they're best fit to really look into um, these potential cases. Thank you very much, Sophie. Marcus, uh, obviously we know that the DMA uh, is a complex piece of, of legislation containing several different, you know, um, narratives or backgrounds or, or ideas or purposes mixing together different competences which wasn't very easy to and which was kind of uh, open to problems or susceptible to problems even beforehand now with this kind of a trend a very kind of systematic trend of national competition authorities trying to use this um, uh, mechanism available in the DMA itself, but also beyond maybe, uh, to complement or accompany their, uh, the, the, the exclusive competences of the Commission with uh, the, their help. Uh, the problems probably, potential hypothetical problems probably scale up or significantly increase. Do you envisage um, many of them in the predictable future? And what would be the most systemic and the most problematic, most difficult one? Um, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Um, this is my second time speaking on the DMA in this series. Um, the, the question here is uh, um, that the legislator, the EU legislator has made a specific choice, which is to uh, have uh, at EU level this particular regime. This is based on Article 114. I mean, we should not forget about that. Um, it's uh, something which means essentially that uh, there was a risk of fragmentation, therefore, for um, safeguarding the, the way the internal market works, the EU decided to have EU legislation on that topic, on, in that area. Now, the fact that you have an EU measure doesn't necessarily mean that you have centralized enforcement. Centralized enforcement was a policy choice made uh, by the EU legislator, and this is a fact. So the legelata, the situation currently is that you have an EU regulation, um, which uh, is essentially uh, administered centrally by the European Commission, and implemented centrally by the European Commission with some exceptions. So article one exception is that um, uh, this particular regulation leaves some space for national laws, national competition laws in particular, which um, are about the unilateral conduct without, however, being a copy paste of article one or two. Um, only one member state has in reality, I mean, okay, Austria is a, uh, it's not really, I mean, uh, uh, like the, the German situation, but I would say only one member state, Germany has taken up that particular uh, facility um, and that's uh, Germany with section 19A. That's one exception. And the other exception is more procedural uh, in nature, which is that um, under article 38.7, um the the it is possible for uh, national competition authorities to um investigate possible non-compliance cases of um, uh, the substantive obligations of the dma so we only have these two exceptions essentially one is about substance and the other is about procedure competence um now is it um, is it a, a good uh, policy choice uh, that we have this? I think it's a it was a compromise, obviously, because some national competition authorities were not happy, um, especially large uh, member states competition authorities, such as from Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, maybe um, they lobbied in order to to have um, a role to play in uh, with the DMA. Now. Um, this is the situation, right? The question is, how do we make the whole thing work and how do we make this a success? I think I, I definitely see a role for national competition authorities. 
Um, as long as, of course, the exclusive competence of the European Commission is not uh, uh, questioned, right? Um, now, um, how this will play in real life, we'll have to see. Um, that being said, I mean, and I suppose that's why I'm invited here. I mean, I have made specific comments about the draft uh, of last week. I think there are a couple of points. Uh, there's a, a particular point where I think the uh, the German uh, draft goes further than Article uh, 38 allows. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a second. What I find quite extraordinary, by the way, it's an aside, but I mention it, is the fact that under Article 38, um, the, the EU legislature essentially defers to national laws so if national laws wish to empower their national competition authorities to play this role, let's say, in terms of the um, uh, first stage investigations, it can happen. But there may be cases where the national, court, national laws have not empowered their national authorities. For some reason, I don't know, I mean, maybe some member states will not empower their national authorities to, to play that role. That's quite interesting. And that's actually uh, against, not against, in the sense of uh, being incompatible with, but um, you know, I don't think the, the regulation should have uh, or needed to have this particular provision, because uh, you know, once you have EU law under the case law, national authorities are bound to apply and implement and, and uh, you know enforce EU law. So I don't think this was necessary, but maybe this this reflects, for example, the different approaches that were uh, um, were there during the uh, negotiation of the instrument. So I think that some member states wanted to have a role. Other member states were not very keen on having a role. So that's why the, the regulation at the end of the day leaves it to the national comp and the national legislators, essentially. Some member states like Germany, Hungary, Luxembourg, Greece, and the Netherlands, uh, and others, no doubt, France, is preparing now legislation, will empower or have already empowered their national authorities. Other member states may not do that. May, may not do that. Thank you, Marcus. Rupert, I know we had this kind of conversation um, before, but I, can you just still, or maybe we, all of us, uh, try to, to remind or to help to understand better the labyrinth of uh, what takes pre precedence over what in terms of uh, Article 1? Of, of, of the DMA, how and plus Article 37 of the DMA. We understand that uh, we have national competition rules, which uh, the, the DMA is without prejudice to it. And if we apply national competition rules uh, such as Article, as Paragraph 19A, it's also na national competition rules. So you can apply it to, to gatekeepers without DMA, without the prejudice to the DMA. Is it correct, or what? What are the? Uh, is there any kind of? Is it paper, rock, scissor game where each rule uh, or face another one constantly, or it's, there is some rational explanation where we can put together all the uh, uh, jigsaw puzzles into one com composed picture? Well, in order not to make any mistakes, I would love to read out the provisions to uh, <laughs> to, to the audience because I think it's uh, rather impossible to rephrase it in in other terms uh, because it it will only go wrong. Um, as you say, uh, the the idea is that national competition rules stay in place, and obviously we have a problem if there is something like so the DMA was enacted with a view to uh, Section 19A of the German Competition Act, uh, so the the drafter knew what was going on um, and and the question in and section 19a just as a reminder for those who haven't followed all episodes of uh, of Olesh, uh, of the Olesh TV show um, is uh, section 19a is the German national gatekeeper regulation but regulation is a wrong word here because um, Germany tries to stay in the realm of competition law here so the Bundeskartellamt designates companies with paramount significance for competition across markets and these companies can then be um, or, or specific provisions can then be activated that are that bind these companies so that's the mechanism of 19a and that of course the, the whole provision is meant for the 
big tech firms for Amazon, Meta, etc. And um, they there have been the first decisions saying that these companies are actually um, addressed by Section 19A. There have not yet been real tough decisions on certain provisions. We've been, we, that is a bit uh, a gray area what's going on there at present. But um, uh, this is somehow in conflict with the DMA. And of course, European law always takes precedent over national law if it covers the same issue. But the question is, what is the same issue here and what is not the same issue? And in Article 1, Paragraph 6 of the, um, of the DMA, it says that national competition rules can prohibit other forms of unilateral conduct. And now I quote, in so far as they are applied to undertakings other than gatekeepers or amount to the imposition of further obligations on gatekeepers. So that is um, the qualification. Either you are not a gatekeeper under the DMA or the, um, uh, the prohibition goes further than that, uh, further than what is required from gatekeepers. And um, my reading of section 19A is, or my, let me give you my personal opinion of what will happen. Um, I think that when the DMA really takes effect, which we expect to be the case in maybe early next year or so on March next year, uh, so when the obligations kick in, then we will probably not see so many 19A cases for a while because then the DMA will be the one big sword to to uh, define what gatekeepers are allowed to do and are not allowed to do. But up to that point, we still have Section 19A. It is in place now. We see that the Bundeskartellamt is active in the field, so they can uh, deal with the matter. And possibly after we have seen the DMA in action for a while, we may see other practices. We may see things that are not in the DMA. And then 19A may play a role again in the sense of uh, it, it goes a bit further than what the DMA prescribes. It is more difficult now to change the DMA um, and to, to include new practices. And that may be a rearm for the DMA for 19A. You have asked for a rational explanation. I think that is sort of the ratio of the of 19A. But of course, there's also this institutional competition, which I think is a good thing, as competition is always a good thing, as we all know. Um, and that competition is the competition between the Bundeskartellamt, who had, that had had been an, a, a real force, a real power in the enforcement of competition law against big tech and the European Commission. And I think Germany wants to make sure that the Bundeskartellamt somehow stays in the game and does not only concentrate on, say, your fuddy-duddy cement cartel in a local market, but can also play a role in, in shaping the European approach towards big tech, maybe even by pushing the commission to, to new boundaries and to, to pointing at the things where the DMA maybe lacks some efficiency. Thank you very much, Rupert. So the bottom line is that section paragraph uh, 19a concerns article 1b, 16b. Of the, D, of the DMA, non 16A. We are not talking about abuse of dominant position. We are talking about unilateral conduct, which, which is slightly a different beast. Yeah, so it's softer. We don't need to establish dominance there. It's a different protocol that which makes it prima facie clearer. Sophia, what is your view about this? And maybe you can uh, highlight a little bit more uh, in conjunction with, with answering this question. Uh, what is the role of what is the relationship between, between the, minister, uh, the Ministry for, for Economic Affairs and Climate Action and the Buddhist Katalan? Maybe it's a slightly different question. Maybe we'll get to it later, but if, if you can combine both, it would be great. Yes, sure. And maybe allow me just to go one step back because uh, I felt in the last round, maybe it was not entirely clear that it's really like what we are doing with our recast and what also the colleagues in uh, other jurisdictions uh, is doing with a view to enforcement of the DMA is really just a long investigation. Uh, nobody, at least from what I know, is proposing that any national competition authority will take any non-compliance decision or impose any fines. That's something that's really uh, up only to the commission. Um, and so I really would like to, to, to separate the two topics of enforcement of the DMA, which is just really to the, competition, uh, to the European Commission. And then this another question, um, what national law or what competition law in general is applicable uh, next to the DMA. Um, and as you said, Article 1.6 uh, is, is basically the, the norm that tells us which competition 
law tools are um, complementary to the DMA. Um, and I think it's um, pretty fair to say also that the, the European competition law will, of course, remain uh, applicable uh, without prejudice to the DMA. So even the, the European Commission will be able to uh, continue their competition law cases. And at the same time, the national competition authorities will be able to do the same. And then the question becomes a little bit more tricky um, looking on German national law because we have 19A. And of course, that's maybe uh, a little bit more um, yeah, aiming at the same goal that the DMA has. But I think um, the legislator really found a great balance in Article 16b. Um, and I think Wupe did a great job in really explaining the, the boundaries that the, the, the Bundeskartellamt will have in applying uh, paragraph uh, 19a. And maybe I would like to add one further um, scenario where the Bundeskartellamt might be able to apply our law um, in the future. And that might be cases where um, we are looking at certain behavior of gatekeepers and uh, their services, which are not core platform services. Um, because as we said before, I think the DMA is pretty straightforward, very concrete. And that's really one of the main differences to um, section 19A, because just to maybe explain a little um, the, the, the kind of way 19A works, it's more a rather abstract catalog of uh, practices that are described really in general terms. And then we add some examples. And so that's really a difference to 19A, uh, to, to the DMA, which is due to its ex ante and self-executing -exec uh, character much more precise. Um, yeah, so that may be due to the relationship of uh, 19A and the DMA. And then the, the government and the Bundeskartellamt, it's really two very separate institutions. Uh, the Bundeskartellamt is a really independent uh, competition authority. And um, therefore, we have no legal or professional supervision um, regarding the casework that the colleagues in the Bundeskartellamt are doing. Um, so we don't interfere um, with the cases that they are doing, and uh, we don't comment on, on, on the work that is ongoing. Thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, Marcus, what is your view on, 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 on this formula? Is it, is it sufficiently efficient? Is it uh, satisfactory? Or there is a room for improvement, or not improvement, at least for, for correct interpretation, maybe? You mean uh, Article 16b and all that? Um, well, I mean, Article 16b essentially uh, allows uh, laws such as Section 19a. So first of all, I'm not one of those who are saying that Section 19a is unlawful or it's incompatible with, uh, e with EU law or the DMA. No, I mean, it, it is allowed uh, to have uh, national rules uh, of this nature. The problem is what exactly can... Um, a national authority do on the basis of Section 19A. By the way, let me just say, Section 19A, I personally, I believe it's a very well drafted uh, uh, piece of legislation. It's quite flexible. It's very different from the DMA. It has, uh, I would say, probably seven general clauses in reality. Instead of having one general, you have seven general clauses. Um, less legal certainty, but more flexibility. That's the other side of the coin, obviously, than the DMA. And I would even say it's um, it's a bit better at the end of the day, if if you want, as a piece of legislation. Okay, that, however, um, it know. goes to you, Sophie. You can have these <laughs> accolades on your shoulders. <laughs> yes, I mean I, I've said that many times that um, I prefer it as a kind of um, a piece of legislation. Now. Whether we like it or not, however, I mean, the DMA is what it is, you know, and it is EU law. So the question really is, how do should we interpret a section, sorry, Article 16B, and how much leeway remains with the Section 19A? 
Um, I have said recently, and I actually uh, used some words which were a bit uh, extreme. I said that there will be blood that will be spilled over, over um, how we interpret uh, Section uh, 19A and uh, Article uh, 16B. And Andreas Mund, my friend Andreas, in uh, Washington said that, oh, I can assure you that there will be no need to bring um, medical kits here for uh, to deal with the blood uh, situation that Makis uh, was describing. But what do I mean by that? I mean that um, there may be cases where um, indeed the specific um, clauses in uh, section 19A, in particular numbers five, to seven, five, six, seven in section 19A. These particular clauses in my view have less to, to, to do, let's say, with specific the specific prohibition, some of the specific prohibitions in the DMA. If you read, however, the general clauses one to four in section 19A, Again, there may be situations where it's not really like the DMA, but it has a lot to do. I mean, I can see a lot of parallelism, essentially. For me, I mean, um, uh, I can give you lots of cases where we're dealing with the same thing. Now, do these numbers, one to four, or any other kind of, uh, you know, um, rule or a particular measure that the Bundeskartelland wants to take further to Section 19A, which echoes uh, one of the substantive obligations under the DMA. Do they constitute further obligations? No, they don't constitute further obligations. These are the same thing. This is the same thing, right? Therefore, uh, Section 19A cannot be applied with regard to these particular obligations. These obligations, to the extent uh, that they are, they can be read in Section 19A, will be a dead letter vis-a-vis -vis the gatekeepers because of the specific obligations of, of, of uh, the DMA. And I would even say that, for example, the Bundeskartelamt or any other national authority, if there were such national legislation, cannot, for example, apply six paragraph two or six paragraph four, or whatever, and say, oh, I apply it in a different way, in a stricter way. This is a further obligation. I want to imp impose further obligations. No, that's not the way to, to read uh, section, uh, Article 16B. One final point, all these articles, 1.5 and 16B, etc., we have to read them in conformity with the legal basis of the DMA regulation. We have to read them in conformity with Article 114. If we read them in a different way, which essentially weakens the rationale, the, the um, uh, harmonization rationale of um, the regulation, uh, that would be something which I think would be incompatible with EU law. And I can mention here specific case law, which is about that particular topic. But you know, I'm sure we will uh, have some articles uh, to be <laughs> written in in the future about that. So. Uh, I'm happy to wait for that. Um, so to cut the long story short, I think that um, Section 19A can be used even vis-a-vis uh, -vis gatekeepers only to the extent that the specific measures that the Buddhist cartel and wants to um, uh, enforce, to implement, have nothing to do with, in, in a qualitative way, nothing to do with the, the specific uh, substantive obligations in five, six, and seven of the DMA. Thank you, Marcus. Rupert, uh, what is, and, and I wanted to ask Sophia as well, to give a chance to, to provide your interpretation of what is, what the further obligations uh, term means in, under Article 16b. I agree with Marcus that this will really be a tough question, and I am 100% sure that uh, the gatekeepers will use every opportunity to litigate that in court if they are on a litigious uh, sort of path. Uh, we sometimes see that some gatekeepers try to uh, seem to have a strategy of dealing with agencies, others seem to try to bring things to court, but they have all the means to bring this to court, and I think I'm, I'm sure that this will indeed 
bring up questions. On the other hand, um, I am not as convinced as Marcus is that that this will definitely, or in that that some of the numbers of 19A will definitely lead to, um, or will definitely be barred or will be dead letter law, as you put it, because the um, because they are wider in 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 the wording. I mean, the DMA is very specific and very detailed in its wording and basically all provisions um, and and if you if you take self-preferencing for an example uh, self-preferencing in article 6 uh, 5 i think of the dma is self-preferencing in certain rankings etc and there is something in 19a which is very very close to that i agree that this specific um uh, number i think it's 1a uh, don't don't uh, quote me on that uh, i would have to look it up now but um if it's 1a it's very very similar to 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 this and i and i would probably say yes that's probably barred but the whole section on self-preferencing in the in section 19a is much wider and goes to other fields than just presentation and ranking it may include other stuff that we um uh, that that may go beyond the self-preferencing in rankings as defined in the in the dma so i think that the margin is is a big wider for the Bundeskartellamt. A different question is whether we really want to see such cases or whether we really would want to encourage the Bundeskartellamt to do that and to, to go on to this path of, of a real, uh, or, or, or on this very thin line that they try to dis differentiate. And I'm pretty sure that the Bundeskartellamt will not try to um, overtake the DMA provisions where it's where we are really in this very, uh, close area because the agencies are not very much interested in in lengthy litigation and particularly not in litigation that may kill uh, their provisions altogether or their possibilities altogether so if the Bundeskartellamt acts on the basis of 19a I would advise them to act in the fields where it is obvious as Marcus has said before where, or where it's where, where they are in a sort of safer space than than in than in other fields and and obviously they should only step in where there's a real need to do something they should not step in for just applying 19a for the sake of applying 19a uh, but identify the problems we have in the digital economy see whether the dma covers that and if if we really run into a competitive problem then do something about it be it on the basis of article 102 be it uh, on the basis of national competition rules or on the basis of 19a marcus do you want to reflect or it's you broadly agree no i agree i mean i and again i said also that um uh, mostly, uh, the the first provisions in, in section 19A will be turned to, to a dead letter. But again, even there, I mean, as you as you just said, uh, there may be boundary areas, or there may be some leeway even there. I mean, but that has to be qualitatively different from what the specific substantive obligations of the DMA say. If it's about something else, then sure. Sophia, now, whether it's a good whether it's a good policy to do that, that's a different thing. I mean, whether the policy is to have that uh, at the national level, even the biggest German, the biggest uh, economy in in Europe, or to have that at a more pan-European level, um, that's a different. That's a policy question. However, it's not a legality question. Yeah, Sophia, how do you see it? I can totally agree with what uh, Upe said. I think it's. Uh really like a fine line that has to be drawn. And uh, I would really refrain from doing this comparison and looking uh, at or, or trying to, to really make this distinction without any concrete uh, case uh, at hand, because I think it will be, well, it will have to be done on a case by case basis. And then it will really be the question is it a original further obligation or a concretization or modification of an existing obligation that we have in the DMA. But then I, like from a political point of view, I would also advise the, the or, and I trust the Bundeskartellamt uh, to do rather those cases where we don't have any possibility to, to act based on the DMA. Um, and, and I think it's also the understanding of the, the Bundeskartellamt that they want to make use of the powers that they have in a, in a useful way and not to start, I don't know, um, a battle who is first and uh, as I said, uh, why would you do a case where you have another point of attack? Um, and so uh, I, I don't think that that this will be the case or the, the way the Bundeskartellamt will apply 19A. Olesh, if I, if I may add one sentence, um, I mean, I think that the, that the German position on this is, is fueled by the 
by something that you said in your introduction, uh, namely, is the European Commission able to administer the DMA? Are they able to really enforce it vis-a-vis -vis many gatekeepers, many obligations? Uh, and or will will they simply sort of uh, be swamped with data, with compliance reports, and and not not do anything? So I think when we when we are now trying to project what's happening in a couple of years, the question is: Will we really see a competitive or more competitive uh, digital environment, an environment that is com contestable and fair? Um, and and uh, I think that we have this fallback option that strong national competition authorities step into the field. I think this is. This is something that we, the asymmetry or the perceived asymmetry of powers with uh, top lawyers in law firms like Marcus's uh, firm uh, being employed by, by a big tech. I don't know, Marcus, whether you advise on that field or not. This is you're just an example of a top lawyer. That's what I wanted to say. And with the, um, and with the difficulties of uh, the European Commission to, to hire staff and to get people um, uh, on the ground sort of doing that, uh, I think that is something as, as the backdrop of this whole discussion that we should not forget. I remember you also mentioned Rupert, uh, uh, on another occasion that you never know what would be the agenda of the Commission in five, ten years' time, and you don't want to subordinate entirely. That's okay. That's another additional, maybe ancillary reason as well. But after this long introductory conversation, part of conversation, let us move finally to the to the the main reason why we, why we, uh, you so uh, kindly agreed to 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 to, to gather in this post Easter Tuesday and have this uh, dialogue, multi log on on the issue of the 11th Amendment, Rupert, we, we, I propose to follow the same structure. You just introduced to us the main uh, substantive elements or the main outline, and then we ask Sophia to reflect the justification, the reasoning behind it, what are the, the motivation and driving force. And then Marcus will be asked this in more critical, maybe, um, reflection upon the implications. And then we'll continue, Rupert. The, the 11th Amendment has three pillars. One is the DMA business. The other one has to do with skimming off profits of uh, after competition law violations, but we leave that out here, I guess. Um, and the main pillar that has been the main feature of discussions in Germany actually is um, something that I can do in a very short way. Germany gets the new competition tool that the European Commission once wanted, and now uh, the German authority will have it, uh, which basically means, um, the Bundeskartellamt can do a sector inquiry. Um, sector inquiry has a very low level of, um, uh, you, you can start that with, with very little sort of uh, evidence that there's something wrong. Um, so you don't need a, uh, you don't need to have uh, strict conditions for entering into a sector inquiry. But if you find um, that competition is not working well in the, in, in the market or in several markets in a sector, that you investigate. Um, at present, this is sort of the end of the sector inquiry. You publish a report, uh, and that's it. Now, in the future, the Bundeskartellam shall be empowered that to, after the sector inquiry, if it finds that there is a um, distortion of competition, let me translate it this way. I don't know exactly how we will translate that in the official translation of the act, or maybe Sophie has that wording already. Uh, I don't, but if it's a <laughs> Störung des Wettbewerbs in German, so if there are problems, if there is a distortion of competition, now the Bundeskartellamt may act and may do things, um, even without finding that any of the companies has violated the law. So if the companies have or if there is something wrong in the market, the, the Bundeskartellamt can now do, let me let me say provocatively, market design or micromanagement of markets. This is now a very provocative way of putting it, and can oblige the companies in that market to alter their contracts, uh, give access to uh, data or to um, inputs, etc. Uh, so all sorts of measures that you would have under um, in a normal competition investigation, but you don't need the violation of the law now, you just need a objective distortion of competition. And this even goes into structural separations, that's the very ultimate ratio of, of the whole thing, and I think this will we will probably not see this in the in the coming years the structural separation and divestiture of companies but the steps before that are pretty strong and are pretty give the Bundeskartellamt a lot of leeway to to um, to regulate a market where they perceive a problem thank you Robert Sophia so we know that you uh, at least in the UK we have this market study regime where uh, 
18 months or so is spent on, on, on investigating the issue, providing such a fruitful soil for discussion. And, you know, it, it, you can write many monographs and PhD theses on, on this topic afterwards, there's many annexes, etc. But you end up with, you know, just, just report, uh, final report, very rich. But uh, often it doesn't lead to market, in, uh, market investigation. Have you been inspired by the UK regime with having a two-tiered approach, or you wanted to, to, to learn from the mistakes of the regime? What, what are the motivation and what are the main elements of the mechanism itself, in addition to what has been said by Rupert? Yes, uh, maybe current discussion ongoing, uh, our translation uh, would be something like a significant and persistent malfunctioning of competition. I mean, uh, I've read some some remarks saying about, uh, I think, uh, distortion or disturbance or disruption of, of competition. And uh, so far, we decided to to translate our Störung des Wettbewerbs as malfunctioning, because that really is, um, I think, the, the closest that we that we have, because we don't, didn't want to have any wording that is already used in um, Article 101. And we didn't want to use a term that uh, indicates something dynamic as disruption, which we used to describe uh, uh, for digital markets. So uh, currently it's, it's malfunctioning of competition. And um, yes, as you said, I think um, the CMA market investigation uh, was one of the inspirations, the new competition tool proposed by the European Commission uh, a while ago were like kind of the main inspiration um, for our draft. And um, going back uh, to the time when we um, drafted the, the proposal, um, I think it was a situation where we had uh, our sector inquiry instrument for quite a while. It was introduced in 2005. And I think um, we had been, um, or we found two shortcomings already a while ago. First of all, it's very long because the uh, Bundeskartellamt never has enough, uh, I think, capacities to really conduct them at high speed. So they take a long time. And then, as, had, as it had, has been said, they always ended with a report. And um, the Bundeskartellamt had no remedies at hand. So um, then um, we had a situation where the Bundeskartellamt um, did um, sector inquiry in the um, fuel market and uh, they found that there are structural problems in the market but they did not see any um, indicators for an infringement of uh, competition law and that was really kind of the uh, point of time where we said okay maybe we have to develop a new and uh, additional instrument uh, in cases where the Bundeskartellamt finds a persistent and significant malfunction of uh, competition. And uh, now uh, the, the draft was um, accepted by our cabinet. And uh, so we hope that it might be accepted um, by the, the legislature, the parliament um, in, the, in the first half of this year. And maybe before I go to Marcus, uh, maybe you can reflect a little bit on, on the paragraph 32 G, G as well. Uh, yeah, so um, that's actually one of the, the BMA pillars that we discussed before, because that's actually where we um, try or where we give the Bundeskartellamt the competence and the investigative power to um, investigate possible uh, non-compliance uh, with the DMA. So that's really nothing that is in a close relation to, to the sector inquiries, but it's just... Um, really close uh, in, in the order, but it's really a different pillar uh, and the pillar that we discussed before. Thank you, Sophie. And Marcus, some commentators uh, labeled this uh, proposed amendment revolutionary, others groundbreaking or paradigmatic changes uh, are being considered. Please explain to us why the, what is so revolutionary there? I have two points to make. One point is a general kind of uh, comment on um, the introduction, the proposed introduction of the market investigation tool in Germany. And then I have a more specific comment on section 32G. Um, now, indeed, the two are different. Right? The one is a fundamental, let's say, a change in, uh, in the system in Germany. Um, 
I, um, as you know, I have been a commissioner at the Greek Competition Authority for a couple of years, and uh, we have that system. We have had it since 2006, if I remember well. Um, and I can tell you it's, um, it's a mixed blessing, let's say. Uh, it can be a blessing, but uh, it can also be a curse to have this uh, very political uh, tool in your uh, uh, kind of uh, in, in your toolbox. Uh, I believe it's the UK, Greece, Romania, Israel, which currently have this tool. Maybe a few member states may have joined in the in the meantime. But I had done some research uh, a few years back, and uh, that was the ones that I had counted. They're all um, influenced by the UK system. What's the problem I have with this? I, it's a more philosophical principle problem, let's say. I don't think competition authorities should be doing that. I think competition authorities uh, are not regulators, uh, in um, like the sectoral regulators. In reality, this is a, a cross-sector regulatory tool. It's a global regulatory tool, essentially, which can be applicable in every particular sector. It's uh, also, if you like, um, an admission of failure by uh, the competition authority that the normal tools of competition law cannot work. And then you have to ask yourself why. I mean, maybe it's a question of uh, um, regulation <laughs> or legislation, or maybe it's a question of uh, private conduct, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I just, for me, it's quite difficult to understand uh, why the normal tools of competition law cannot give uh, um, a solution here. So for me, I mean, I don't like, if you like this particular uh, tool, but all based on pure policy grounds. I mean, I don't think that this is the job of uh, competition authorities. This is a very regulatory and paternalistic tool, you know, and, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it should be uh, it should be le the legislator. I mean that uh, can take such uh, positions instead of uh, uh, competition authorities. I mean, um, if, from a legal point of view, it's something that member states can uh, introduce, obviously. And this is Article Three, Paragraph Two of Regulation One, Two Thousand and Three, uh, last sentence. Um, that's where historically the market investigation provisions have been interpreted to to fall under. Um, so you know, I mean, nothing to say on the legal uh, side, but um, from a policy point of view, it's not something that I like. But you know, we're going there. These these are the days of regulated competition law. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm not surprised that uh, Germany and other countries are going there. Now, the specific point I have with regard to uh, Section 32G, which is the DMA kind of uh, competence uh, section, everything is good. I mean, when you read that provision, the only problem I see is in the last sentence, if I remember well, where they say, for example, that, uh, aha, they, then the Buddha's cartel Amt can um, uh, open an investigation, the investigation is going on, and then, um, you know, uh, the commission uh, kicks in, and obviously um, the Bundes Kartellamt will uh, um, give the case to the European Commission. And then there is this, this kind of naive sounding words at the end, which say, and by the way, the Bundes Kartellamt may also publish a report at the end of the investigation or something like that. I mean, and the points I have, first of all, what end of investigation? What investigation? I mean, the investigation has not ended. This is a pre-stage of the investigation. This is the national pre-stage of the investigation. There is no investigation that has ended. There's no end of the investigation. The commission will be will, will essentially give us the end of the investigation when the commission will take the decision. Then Article 38.7 speaks about the National Competition Authorities reporting to the Commission. Reporting meaning within the ECN, you know, this kind of uh, confidential and never public reports, essentially, between National Competition Authorities and the European Commission. This is what Article 38.7. Article 38 does not speak about public reports of National Competition Authorities, essentially. So the, the publicity of this report is what makes this provision incompatible, in my view, with Article 38. And also, um, it's a very 
uh, also from a policy point of view, I can see how this is going to work. I mean, in, in real life, in real life, uh, you will have cases, for example, where um, the Bundeskartalamt will issue this report and this report will uh, will be used as a kind of competing pre-decision before the commission takes its decision. It can also, in the meantime, be um, relied upon in national courts, for example. Yes, the case is um, pending before the European Commission, but there is this report of 38 pages or 138 pages of the Bundeskartelamt, which is essentially saying uh, um, how, man how many kind of violations we have had and so on and so on. Uh, you see, I mean, that's how it's going to work in real life, this report. And um, um, therefore, I think uh, that's um, not something, it goes against the letter and the spirit of Article 38.7. And uh, definitely, I would uh, recommend uh, the German legislator to drop uh, this particular point, because uh, it's, it's not, uh, it, it's not, it's illegal, but at the same time, from a policy perspective, it's quite bad I mean, the way it is. Uh, it, ca it can work in real life. Thank you, Marcus. Ruprecht and Sophia, Maybe I, if I... I wanted to ask you both <laughs> to comment upon this. Sophia, please. Okay. <laughs> no, um, thank you. Um, and sorry for interfering. In fact, I hope you're uh, okay if I go ahead. No, just uh, regarding the, the last remark and the last sentence concerning the report, I think um, I understand the concerns, but I think we address them in the, the, the explanatory memorandum of our uh, draft. Um, as you said, or as you rightly said, first of all, the, the Bundeskartellamt may publish a report. And um, we explain uh, that the decision whether the Commission, uh, the, the Bundeskartellamt will publish uh, a report will be taken in close uh, cooperation and coordination with the European Commission. And of course, uh, we and as well as the Bundeskartellamt are very aware of a uh, possible situation where it would be absolutely um, uh, problematic to publish a report. Um, but I think this will be taken in, in account uh, by, by the Bundeskartellamt. And uh, therefore, we feel that it's just the, the possibility for the Bundeskartellamt to also talk about what they have been doing and uh, so maybe one could uh, specify that at the end of their investigation because uh, what you said with a view to the, the entire investigation is, uh, is absolutely true the investigation will be finished by by the European Commission. Thank you very much. Sophie. So Rupert what is your reading of this is it something ultra-virus or is just you know you you demonstrate the you summarize the work which has been done and just in the, in the spirit of, of transparency, you just inform the public what is your stand regardless of, of the or, or irrespective of, of legal implications or not, in, not, not expecting any legal implications from this report. I'm, I'm more with Sophie here than with uh, Marques, sorry to say that, uh, Marques. Uh, I think there is, I don't actually see a legal issue um, because the um, uh, I, I don't read Article 38 as prohibiting anything from uh, from from the national enforcing agencies to be made public. I think that would be a wrong understanding of of uh, how authorities work. And actually, it's in my view, it's rather the other way around. Um, if you do something, uh, you would, as a citizen, ask your authority. Uh, or to be transparent, to have some some sort of uh, the Bundeskartellamt needs to justify why they spend their money and their resources on, on something, and and then they say no, no, we just we just do some work for the commission, but we never say what it is about. I would I would find that a strange um, I would find that a strange attitude of of a public authority that um, that acts in a field, and also from a policy perspective. Um, I, I do not have any strong reservations. I would rather see it as um, as something that refreshes the field, that inspires the field. I mean, if the Bundeskartellamt comes to a certain conclusion, here it is. I mean, they have investigated something. They will make clear what is the sources for their investigation. They will make clear what is the boundaries of it, what they did. Um, everyone knows that the final decision in public administration will be taken by the European Commission. But this is their report. Hey, this is what we've done. And if courts think this is good as evidence in a public, in a sorry, in a private enforcement case, 
then let it be like that. I mean, the courts uh, will not sort of. Uh, I mean, I mean, the courts are not bound by, um, by are not bound by it in, le in a legal way. But the parties need to bring evidence, and if there's evidence from a competition authority. Okay, here we go, and and then it's up to the gatekeepers to say, oh, but this is not complete, and and the European Commission would see this differently, and fair enough. So, so may that may be the thing. I'm not. I'm. I, I personally don't think that that uh, centralized enforcement of a law is always a good thing in the sense of uh, this may put us on a uh, on a track where um, where there's no input, no no inspiration from other fields. So I'm happy with wherever that is sort of broken up a bit, and I don't see a violation of the law here. Instead, I see some more transparency, some more inspiration, even maybe a strengthening of private enforcement that I personally would um, uh, think is a good thing in, in, in the DMA, even though that may lead to fragmentation as well. Let me say uh, one thing on the other issue, if I may, on sector inquiries. And I think Mark has made um, interesting and important points there as well. Um, I think uh, what, what you said is we witness these days a lot of um, flexibilization or um, a lot of initiatives where competition authorities gain more power. Uh, look at Article 22 of the merger regulation, for an example, where the Commission expands its powers to review mergers to get out of the out of the strict th thresholds of the merger control regulation. Just as an example, and now we see the sector inquiry and and other fields, and. The first thing, as as an academic, speaking as an academic now, I think that's really very interesting to witness, to, very interesting to observe how how this sort of pendulum now swings to a more informal approach. And just 10, 20 years ago, the Commission and Western and European competition authorities told other countries in the world, make it formal, make it strict, uh, don't uh, make, give too much discretion to, uh, to um, agencies, and now sort of the pendulum swings back. But as Marcus has also, also said, I think this is the reaction to the boundaries, to the shackles that we are sometimes in now in, in antitrust. I think we've, I, I, I also see that we have failed in, in enforcing competition rules in the way in, in a meaningful way, in a way that is not overburdened by economics, that is not overburdened by lengthy procedures. I mean, if you look at, at cases like Intel or or other cases that run for ages and and uh, where, where we go into incredibly detailed um, uh, proceedings on the commission stage, on the court litigation stage, I think that this system has achieved too little uh, in the past years That is that it is becoming dysfunctional. I have to say that in this, really provocative stance that uh, we are making abuse provisions in particular dysfunctional. Um, that, that of course now is a balance that you have to strike between legal certainty on the one hand and the rights of the parties on the one hand and the protection of competition and the possibilities of competition agencies to step in. And now we are sort of seeing somehow how the pendulum swings into, into the other direction. That doesn't say anything on whether this very concrete measure is correct or not. Um, I I tend to side with the um, people who, who say, yeah, well, let's try this in Germany. And the reason for that is something that is exactly the other way around than Marquez perceives things. Um, but we agree again on, 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 I think, on the diagnosis. And that is that um, if we do not do that, we always see politics meddling into markets, and and the and they uh, they see a problem. This was how this all came about. Actually, they see a problem in some market. Politics steps in and says, "Oh, we have to do this and that." And these regulatory interventions, in my view, are worse than the ones. For now, speaking from a policy perspective, uh, uh, and from a competition and economics perspective, are worse than what uh, the lawmakers often comes up with some sort of populist intervention into markets that I rather want to um, avoid. So it has some uh, it has some uh, benefits in that regard as well. Uh, th thank you very much, Rupert. Marcus, so basically you, you, you confirmed the two, two questions or two comments maybe. One, what's the, 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 the meaning of the smile? Is it the, the, the contempt of court staff or, or Section 32G? And the second one, you as a, as a PhD holder from the European University Institute, <laughs> being so uh, enjoying the peripatetic discussions about the philosophical foundations of competition policy. So in two minutes or five minutes, the floor is yours. 
Well, you, these are very serious and difficult questions, uh, Oles. I mean, um, on the point of um, so, so essentially, you're asking me first to to say something about again about uh, section. Well, uh, uh, unless you want to reflect, the, 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 the problem what Sophia and Rupert said. The, the problem I have with that particular uh, section is that um, uh, it is essentially weakening the, the exclusive competence of the European Commission. If you read uh, um, the specific text that is used at the end in FINE of Article 38.7, it says those authorities shall report to the Commission on the findings of such investigation in order to support the commission in its role as sole enforcer of this regulation. These words are not there. You know, the report to the commission on the findings of their work essentially, but this, why, do, why does that provision again stress the fact that this is, the commission is the sole enforcer, right? All this is not by chance, in my view. So I believe that the letter also of, of that particular provision does not leave that leeway, essentially. To me, this is like all these um, communications that we have between national competition authorities within the ECN when they apply the competition rules. Yes, transparency. I would love to, to see what the commission says when uh, national competition authorities send draft decisions under Article 11.4. But I cannot, right? I mean, because that's the way the system works. <laughs> so you know, um, to me, it's a, it's a, it's exactly the same thing. But more than the letter, it's the spirit, I think, which is there. because to me, it's like a circumvention or a, a little bit of circumvention of the of the rule of uh, exclusive competence. Anyway, I mean, it is what it is. We will see how this is uh, this is employed in in real life. Don't forget also on that particular point that. Um, you may have situations where a national competition authority opens an investigation on non-compliance, uh, sends the case to the commission, publishes the report, let's say, the report is in the public domain, and then the commission simply does not believe that there has been a violation of the substantive obligation. The commission cannot take positive decisions, right? In the legal reality, what will remain is just the report. I mean, think about that. There is no Article 10 like you have in Regulation 1 2003. The Commission cannot take a positive decision and say, I certify that a particular GAFA is complying with Article 6, Paragraph 3, right? And you have two, uh, and you have nothing on the Commission side, and you have the report <laughs> on, on the Bundeskartellamt side. That, that's a, another scenario which I think is problematic. Now, uh, to go to your, uh, I think the, this, these are all interesting questions. Um, I always try to uh, visit those questions uh, from the point of view of um, a more kind of philosophical approach, a more policy oriented approach rather than uh, 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 the black letter kind of lawyers uh, approach. Um, uh, and uh, this I owe a lot to my academic past. I mean, and uh, definitely um, what helps um, the enforcer, the uh, practitioner, and uh, any kind of lawyer is to be able to take a step back. I mean, the, this is what uh, academia gives you, which this is what a PhD can give you at the end of the day is the idea that you can take a step back and see the whole thing in a more kind of uh, uh, if you want uh, a global uh, approach. And I think, yes, I may have wasted, let's say, <laughs> three and four years of my life in doing that and um, taking care of the footnotes and all that, but I don't think uh, uh, I don't think I would have been able to do that, uh, to take that more global approach if uh, I had not uh, had not gone. Uh, at uh, Via dei Rocettini number nine and studied uh, <laughs> there with such people such as Klaus Ellermann and uh, all these other grand uh, personalities. Thank you very much, Matos. Uh, Sophia, I wanted to ask you, how do you, do you want to reflect upon this uh, last exchange uh, between the not exchange, but you know, exchange of thoughts uh, between Rupert and Marcus on, on section 32G? Um, I think we had the same discussion when uh, I started working on the DMA. Everybody was saying, oh, wow, this is uh, entirely new and this is more 
regulation like and shouldn't uh, the DMA look more like 19A because that has the same systematic um, structure that we are used to. I think it was uh, mentioned also today that uh, 19A uh, is the better uh, DMA. And I think just as I'm not so much used to, to, to all the competition theory and how the, the, the normal process should go. For me, it's uh, interesting to see the discussion because um, just from a, a broader perspective or coming new into, into the field, um, for me, it makes totally um, sense to, if you look at the situation and you see, okay, we don't have a, um, an instrument or a working functioning tool that can address um, a problematic situation or where a situation where the market is not really working the way it should be um, to, to decide as a legislator that we need to complement our toolkit and to, to design new instruments to, to give the competition authorities um, the tools to, to, to do that task. Um, and so I don't want to, to enter into the philosophical uh, discussion, but uh, just taking a broader picture, um, I think it's, it's a natural um, development that we see. I mean, uh, the entire surrounding develops, we see um, new um, markets, we see uh, so many global uh, trends. And I think as a legislator, it's always our task to see, okay, how are things changing? Is our law still fit for the task? And then if you see that there are gaps to, to try to address them. Um, to make sure that, uh, yeah, the law basically fulfills its goal. Thank you very much, Sophie. We have another um, issue which we didn't discuss yet, mentioned in passing, but which is which plays crucial role, supposedly, or potentially, private enforcement. So maybe we can uh, end the substantive part of our conversation today by reflecting upon, upon this mechanism. It, it's been reinforced, it's been reinvigorated, uh, supposedly, Ruprecht. Can you elucidate on, uh, on this, please? Sure. I mean, in the first uh, draft of the, of the DMA, we didn't see any mentioning of private enforcement. And we were unsure whether the European Commission that presented that draft even, even thought that pri whether private enforcement is possible or not, or whether they had not given any thought of that or, or, or what their position was on that. And then uh, throughout the negotiations of the DMA, uh, this topic uh, came into the DMA now with at least one provision, which shows that the DMA thinks that there is private enforcement of, of the DMA, that is to say, users, but I, I mean, the, the situation that we have in mind is that a business user sues a gatekeeper for um, be it for a cease and desist order by a court or even for damages if um, if one specific right that has been conferred to business users um, has been violated and um, th there is a general sort of understanding in European law that if you are conferred such a right, you may go to court and sue for it. Uh, and that, of course, means that uh, the reading of the European Commission as the sole enforcer of the DMA is only relevant for public administration, but not for uh, what happens in the courts. And actually now in 27 member states, uh, people could go to maybe hundreds of courts and, and raise um, claims that are DMA related. Now, what the German government did um, was to um, facilitate these claims and maybe also to channel these claims a bit in the sense that specialized chambers, Sophie mentioned that earlier, specialized chambers of German courts that are already dealing with uh, competition related matters. So that's a fewer number of courts with more specialized people um, will hear these cases that are DMA related um, that may on the one hand make it easier to it will become a bit easier maybe to bring such cases. On the other hand, these cases will be dealt with possibly potentially in a more pro professional way and um, the I personally think it's a good way to have private enforcement I see private enforcement as an important corrective mechanism correction mechanism to public enforcement to the um, weaknesses of public enforcement as well um, it will be difficult to sue companies I mean there is an asymmetry maybe between the, the, the different parties that are uh, opposed in these proceedings um, and also if 
it will of course be difficult to prove that there has been a violation as is always the case um, but um, but we may see such cases and I'm, I'm really curious how that will play out in practice and in particular how what happens when one court say the district court of Amsterdam or of Dortmund or whatever place in Europe uh, will say we interpret this rule in this way and um, we have some uh, or, or it, it's sort of difficult sort of to see the coordination mechanism uh, play out in um, in practice and uh, in the end the European Court of Justice will will have to deal with some of these cases I assume it, it will be legal chaos I can tell you I mean, you will have <laughs> thousands hundreds of judges from Palermo to Helsinki essentially potentially taking conflicting uh, uh, judgments and for me the most problematic area is season disease kind of situation because damages claims uh, you know follow on yeah of course I mean there's nothing to say about that so but that is not a problem of that that is not the issue that has been created with the 11th amendment I mean this is the DMA and uh, the DMA itself as you may know I have pleaded in favor of adopting a system uh, which would be essentially allowing only follow-on claims. Uh, there were voices saying, oh, this is um, this is completely incompatible with the, the treaty, et cetera. And then you see what the Court of Justice says in DB Station. <laughs> and then you tell me that what I was saying was incompatible with the treaty. But anyway, that's a different story. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think that this has the potential of creating uh, issues we will see. I mean, definitely, uh, these complainants, um, complainants uh, such as business users in particular, will uh, uh, will take that into account. If I were a business user, or if I were, if I was advising such a business user, my advice would be: try first the European Commission, file a complaint, informal complaint, see what happens. They don't respond. Go to Andreas Mund. That's your second uh, option. Uh, for some reason, uh, they don't respond file an action for damages, <laughs> sorry, file, an, file a cease and desist action in uh, any kind of member state. By the way, question to both of you, the market investigation tool that Germany is going to introduce, the, the measures, when a party wishes to challenge the measures, do you still keep the Düsseldorf court uh, or, or do you go directly to the BGH? What's the, um, what is the, the challenging uh, process there? I mean, do you? It's think the Düsseldorf it's court. Yeah. yeah. It's you go to the Ober Oberlandesgericht. Okay, I see. Can you explain why this question is important just as a curiosity or there are some implications? You know, I'm not, uh, you should ask uh, the Germans about that, but uh, my understanding is that in the DMA, sorry, in the section 19A, uh, you don't have the Oberlandesgericht, the Court of Appeal essentially is not dealing, and you have just one degree, you go directly to the Supreme Court for civil matters. Um, whereas um, for these measures, apparently the first instance uh, is retained. By the way, as a curiosity in Greece, the measures that the authority takes uh, as a result of um, the market investigation tool are not challenged before the court, the administrative court of appeal, but they're challenged directly to the Conseil d'État because they are they are seen precisely as regulatory measures, and therefore you challenge them not with a full merits challenge to the administrative court of appeal, but you go with a, an, a recur on an which is a, like a. Um, it's more on legality. It's a much more limited, essentially, uh, recourse. And you go directly to the Conseil d'État because these are regulatory measures. That's an interesting point, essentially. You you wish for that for <laughs> Germany? So we have a reduced... <laughs> no, no, no. I'm fine with the Oberlandesgericht. <laughs> uh, thank you. I wrote I, that I, down. <laughs> Sophia, I wanted to ask you of you on private enforcement and the, and the debate. Yes, maybe just... Uh, to reply to, to Marcus' remark, I think in 19A we just have one instance because we believe that um, the 19A is of course targeted for digital markets where which are like extremely dynamic and therefore we have seen that uh, cases take a very long time if they go to both instances uh, going back and forth and so we just wanted to make sure that um, 
we have uh, really fast um, results. Um, and then on public uh, enforcement, I think it's fair to say, basically going back to what I said right in the beginning, we believe that the DMA will only deliver uh, to its goal if we have a really stringent uh, enforcement. As we have a decentralized centralized enforcement by the commission, we are not fully um, convinced that the commission can do the task and really look at all the obligations, all the gatekeepers at the same time. So we think every um, additional enforcement instrument um, might help. And that's why we also um, took the opportunity to, to facilitate private enforcement, because uh, as it was said, uh, the DMA really foresees private enforcement. Uh, enforcement. Um, Article 30, um, 39, um, gives us some indication on how chaos might be prevented um, as national courts can uh, really try to cooperate with the European Commission. And um, yeah, so we hope that this is one further um, also incentive for gatekeepers to, to just obey and implement the obligations and provisions. Thank you very much, Sophie. So we close our meetings with uh, asking our distinguished guests to provide some tips to students because they are witnessing this cacophony of different challenges, AI, Fish and Chips Act, etc., coming along constantly. And it's really difficult to, 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 be, to remain focused and to know, and knowing where to focus matters a lot. And who could be more a meritorious advisor on these issues than people who are on, on the top of this of these discussions. Maybe you can suggest a topic or maybe some life hack. You wake up at four o'clock and or you don't sleep at all. Anything which can be <laughs> helpful to our students or you sleep a lot uh, would be appreciated. So Rupert, let's start with you. I would always recommend to follow uh, Oleg Andrichuk's uh, video handles and and uh, <laughs> to 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 be abreast with uh, with current developments. Uh, and if someone knows a life hack how to how to follow all that stuff, I'm interested in that too. Uh, the one thing that I would say to students, and that I keep repeating to students, and I think that this talk is a good uh, example of that in good and in bad. Um, I'm in the bad category here is uh, go abroad uh, as a young person as often and uh, as far as you can. Uh, you, the two of you marveled about your times at, at the European University Institute in, in Italy. And I think that's a um, now, now being on the job, I find that uh, it becomes more difficult to go abroad, particularly if you're then becoming older, have families, stuff like that. Uh, I'm saying that I'm speaking from Aix-en-Provence this moment. I'm I'm in uh, France, so I made a little escape here. And I think that's also important for these discussions. And that's what I where I would relate that back in that sense that um, people like me always come from a very German perspective. We see what the Bundeskartellamt does. We think that the Bundeskartellamt is the center of the, of the world anyway. Uh, and then we learn okay other competition authorities see things completely differently and do not we even want to go against big tech and other and then then there are people from from other places if you speak with americans they have a different uh, view on this etc and and to broaden your mind to be able to capture as many inspirations as possible i think it's a perfect thing to go abroad um, and you as students have that opportunity in a much better day, way than than later in life so do it thank you Rupert. marcus um, competition law is changing. I think these are, these are very interesting times to study competition law because clearly it is changing. I mean, the uh, when I was studying uh, competition law um, back in those days, the students and the professors tended to be critical of the commission. For example, they thought that the commission was relatively uh, um, kind of... Um, um, uh, strict in, in its enforcement and therefore it was the, the days when um, the American kind of theories, um, less intervention, etc. were quite uh, uh, appealing, I have to say. Now in the other extreme, I mean, um, uh, in the universities, certainly there is a very uh, pro-interventionist kind of approach. I think the truth or essentially it's somewhere in between the two extremes, I think. But certainly, these are very interesting times. Um, 
there is complexity. There is complexity because on the one hand you have um, uh, the politicians, you have the uh, the, the parliaments, etc., which. Uh, think in a certain way, then you have competition authorities. Then there's a lot of complexity and um, um, I would say um, divergence among competition authorities. In, for example, you put together the European Commission and the FTC. I can tell you <laughs> there's a lot uh, that separates the two. Maybe the FTC and uh, the Bundeskartell Amt, I'm not so sure that there are so much divergence, but certainly between the FTC and the Commission, there's a lot of divergence. And then there are other authorities where, uh, you know, so, and then you have the, the courts. And essentially at the EU level, the courts, I would say now are where we were like 10 years ago. So now the courts have discovered uh, uh, the new economic approach, the effects-based analysis, etc. Uh, they are where we, you know, we were 10 years ago. And then the court would say in cases uh, such as uh, uh, you know, uh, British Airways and other cases, this is immaterial, etc. Now the court is like um, uh, Seoul in the gates of Damascus, uh, which has, they have now um, started uh, since Intel, they are reinterpreting uh, the case law in a certain way. How long this will uh, last, it's not clear. I mean, we see the European Commission now uh, making some tweaks in the guidance paper, etc. It's very, very interesting. I mean, the, 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 this shows you that competition law is a very political area. Uh, that's why I love it. Uh, this is not, I have no, no offense to the civil lawyers, you know, the BGB, you know, et cetera, and all that, you know, I, I respect that, but I find our area of law very interesting, very kind of close to real life and how the economy and politics uh, move. And therefore, I'm really happy that uh, I'm uh, our competition lawyer and doing what I'm doing. Thank you very much, Marcus. Sophie? Um, yeah, first of all, I would recommend to learn German so you can listen to Ruprecht's podcast, the Anruf Wettbewerb, uh, which gives the, the, the real overview about everything that's going on in the, the competition field. Um, no, but a little more serious, I think um, it's super interesting as a student to focus on the things that are just developing because I felt that uh, during my studies, um, there are some fields where you can continue reading and reading because everything has been said about one question and one question, five answers. And if you look at the more um, current topics, uh, the discussions are just evolving and that's a point of time where you can kind of influence uh, how um, or which roads are taken, which interpretation um, uh, becomes the, 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 the main opinion. And um, so I think the DMA generally is a super interesting and um, important topic. But then also there are other competition uh, law legislat legislations, which I feel don't have as much um, publicity as the DMA. For example, the foreign subsidies regulation. And um, so if someone would ask me like, what should I write my thesis about? I think that would be a really nice uh, topic because there are so many questions unanswered um, where you can really, as a student, try to, to develop uh, some, some new approaches, interpretations, that it would be really fun to, to look into that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sophie. Rupert Paulson, as a Marcus Communus, Sophie Gappa, I'm very grateful for your time and for sharing your really bright ideas, for creating this really uh, collegial atmosphere for of, of fruitful and genuinely curious discussion. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.